Welcome to the Cool Tools Show. I'm Mark Frauenfelder, Editor-in-Chief of Cool Tools, a website of tool recommendations written by our readers. You can find us at cool-tools.org. I'm joined by my co-host, Kevin Kelly, founder of Cool Tools. Hey, Kevin. Hey, it's great to be here. In each episode of the Cool Tools Show, Kevin and I talk to a guest about some of his or her favorite uncommon and uncommonly good tools they think others should know about. Our guest this week is Mike Liebold. Mike is a distinguished fellow and senior researcher at the Institute for the Future, exploring future technology systems, working with clients, global leaders, researchers, and public groups. Mike's a pioneer and veteran with decades of experience as a senior researcher for iconic companies like Atari, Apple, Netscape, and Intel. He's a friend and a colleague at IFTF, and I'm really excited to have him because we always have great discussions at IFTF. How are you, Mike? Great. Thank you. Yeah, Mike, it's really great to reconnect with you. Um, we also have gone back a long way, um, whole earth days and uh, and before. So um, I'm really interested to hear what your favorite tools are. Great. Uh, and over the years, I, I actually keep a mental note of things to c- contribute to the Cool Tools website, and I'm always a little slow, so I'm really thrilled to catch up on a few. That's All righty. Cool. And so, Mike, one of the things I noticed that you you have a, a an iPad Mini, and I've seen you um, using various like media collection tools to stay on top of tech trends. And so that that was one thing I wanted you to talk about. T- t- tell me about your your latest setup that you're using with your advanced search tools. Well, for a long time, my favorite setup was an app called Flipboard that that, that dynamically created um, a personal magazine. But uh, they they ran into a real financial problem with the bottom line and started you know, spamming way too many ads. So uh, I've reverted back to um, Twitter's Tweet Deck. But uh, all of these search tools really kind of rely on a fundamental uh, understanding of some really basic search tools, and um, you you get more out of Google, get more out of Twitter, get more out of streaming. Uh, social media information. If you understand a bit about um, the, the the operators uh, of these services, and so I've always paid really close attention to the 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 many uh, advanced Google tools for Google searches to help curate my information. What's an example of one of them uh, in Google? What, what what's a little trick that you do with Google? Do you have do you have alerts? Do you have alerts set up? I, I have for many years, but I don't anymore uh, because uh, uh, Google News is 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 not the, not the place for me to uh, aggregate information anymore. Twitter Twitter's where I, I aggregate information, but my tools for for Google search are um, the minus sign for a term that I really don't want. Uh, if I'm looking, you know, there's a lot of ambiguous phrase that are phrases that are common in many many domains, and if you want to filter out. You say chemistry when you're talking about uh, molecular engineering, um, then um, then you'd get information about molecular engineering minus a lot of the uh, other kind of chemical information that might just have a little embedded section. The other thing is I use wait, wait, wait. So, for, so, so the so the the, um, the minus thing uh, I, I'm not sure how, how are you yeah. using the minus? Ex- explain that minus. It excludes terms. So you have chemistry minus nano or something like that? No, I would have na- nano minus chemistry. If I wanted to talk about nano engineering and without the chemical references, the minus, I would take the chemistry references out of the search. Or, or another example would be banana minus slug. If you're just interested in bananas, right. but not banana slugs. Right, right. And so exactly. how, do you do this, how do you do the same with Twitter? So are you, are you, what do you search Twitter for? What's an example of one of your your setups? A, a term or or tweet deck actually? Well, uh, the uh, it's a different set of search tools for Twitter, but uh, the main thing I do is I curate lists of experts. Mm. Um, when I when I I find it like a scientist or academic, I look for who they're following. And one of my great tricks is I people don't realize that you can add people to a list without following them. And if, then if you view a list, you get all of the tweets from that person. So I, I follow uh, networks of scientists, networks of authors, uh, networks in many different domains. So, uh, so that, that is one of the key, key tricks. Uh, I keep many channels on TweetDeck uh, for different lists. 
And so I have curated streams. And so those those uh, those streams are not cluttering up your mainstream because you, you you have to kind of go to them uh, specifically if you want to see nanotechnology your list and you'll see all the tweets in that stream, but it's not ordinarily filling up your day to day stream. It is, and I don't use the day to day stream for anything. It's just jumbled because I the way I use Twitter is, is segregated into at any, t- at any time 15 or 20 topical channels and, and they autofill. Um, and so I, I don't use Twitter as a social medium. I use other media as a social media. So tw- Twitter is just a, it's an information engine for me. As an advanced researcher, uh, I just, uh, you know, I mean, it, 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 it futures researcher, uh, I'm able to stay up with advanced uh, developments in, in any domain at my fingertips. It's autofills. I used a, a tool called RSS before that, and um, the, that that was originally ended, uh, invented by a colleague at Netscape, Guha. And uh, um, there were, before that, I, I had auto autofill um, streams on... Um, Old, old services in the old days called Dialogue and another earlier one from Systems Development Co- Corporation called Orbit, where I would have topical auto auto notices of every every subject I was interested in. Okay. So that's your that's your research uh, tool. What uh, Tell us about another um, tool that you're really um, uh, excited by, you use every day, I guess. Sure. You know, I've got, I've got two lives. I go down to Palo Alto and I work on high technology um, analysis. And uh, I get back up here on the mountain on the coast side and I've got eight acres of pasture and redwoods and oak and pine trees. And it is an incredible task removing biomass and keeping a fire safe zone and everything else around here. So all my free time is, is, is spent actually out outdoors. And my, I use uh, 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 the lowest end Toyota four wheel drive truck you can get the SR pickup truck. Um, it's four cylinders and it doesn't have any of the elegant packages. And it, it is in fact built on the identical platform of a truck I reviewed in cool tools many years ago, a 1994 Toyota base model four by four that last got 240,000 miles on it. And <laughs> this is the replacement. And so I drive it, I drive it like a tractor. Uh, I, I throw stuff in it and I still can get on the freeway and it's comfortable. It's got a nice, much better sound system and more comfortable seats than the other one. And plus I calculated the cost of this truck compared to the truck I bought in 94 for $19,000. And this one's 24, but at the rate of inflation, this is about 30% cheaper than the truck I bought back in um, 1994. So it's, it, if you really are going to be doing rugged work outside, uh, I think probably a lot of people who live out there are probably already know about these uh, Tacoma trucks. And um, the uh, this new model, besides the better sound system, is 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 it at all improved from the? Or would you bet? Would someone do better looking for a 1990s mid 99 uh, model as used, or, or, or are they are you doing better with getting a new one? I, it, I I have on occasion bought used cars, but I don't think I'd ever buy a used car with more than thirty thousand miles on it. Okay. Um, it, 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 it you, unless you know the owner personally, you just don't know how it's treated. Uh, so that's that's my guideline. Um, uh, and my take is that people who have these drive them forever, and so I, I'm always a little suspicious about a used vehicle. So. I, I drove mine for 20, 24 years. Yeah. <laughs> right. So tell us about, since you're hauling a lot of uh, biomass and stuff, tell us about some of your biomass tools, um, but you're like in firewood and other um, biomass that you deal with. Yeah. 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 It's, there's a lot of brush and, and pine branches. Um, uh, and I, I, I'm lucky that I get a lot of windfall firewood. We get we're up on a ridge and we get the these great southern uh, forty mile an hour gusts every time there's a storm. So I just go out and and um, buck up uh, madrone or oak and throw it in the truck. And so I really enjoy splitting firewood myself um, <clears throat> rather than um, a mechanical splitter, which is just too easy. And plus, um, the wedge will just neatly split the wood into four pieces it's magical okay. and very satisfying 
And for the tough right. ones, then I'll get an eight pound sledge and, uh, and really split it. <laughs> right. Um, so, so that's the, the, the splitting wedge and, and, and then you have, um, uh, the splitting malls, you have two, two different malls you want to suggest. Oh yeah. Uh, a three pound mall is, it's just like a heavy hammer and it's, it's pretty easy to work with. And it, it, you know, it, it's not the kind of, uh, giant sledge you have to lift way over your head and hammer it. It, 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 it. it is more like a carpentry hammer, a little bit heavier, heavier. And it's very easy to use um, with a good wedge for um, for softwoods like pine for kindling uh, or or for uh, heavier woods with a really good wedge um, that are still green enough to split well. And then uh, I use a, an eight pound maul, which is a sledgehammer on one side and the splitting wedge on the other side for um, hard, w- wood that's harder to split. Um, seasoned um, madrone is a little harder to split, and eucalyptus is incredibly difficult. I'm, I've given up on euke, but uh, uh, that, but you do sometimes um, the you, you can't just apply enough pressure with a three pound maul. So I'll I'll drop the heavy hammer on it. Very satisfying. I sit out there with with a beer and I put on. KPEG on the radio and split wood. It's, it's kind of my comfort zone out there in, on a beautiful day. <laughs> and do you, do you heat, do you heat with wood or is it just sort of more, I wouldn't call it uh, rich ritual heating uh, fire, but are do you actually heating your house with wood? Well, the power goes out here almost every week because of where we are up in the Ridge at the very, very end of the grid. So uh, when the power goes out, we just close off the, the, the the fireplace room which is right adjacent to the kitchen and yeah i'll 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 heat with firewood every time the power goes out we have a generator going to fire the uh to run the uh the stove and the microwave and power computers and cell phones and things like that but uh yeah uh, but otherwise we just use it for just um nice evenings around playing cards or reading books or uh listening to the stereo or something you, you mentioned that um, while you're um, splitting, you, you have a pair of uh, safety glasses that you use? Yeah. Uh, still, the Chainsaw brand um, actually sells uh, very cheap safety glasses, but they're styled like really cool Ray-Ban glasses. They're, they're super cheap. They sell for between $11 and $19 at your local hardware store. And um, they're really good safety glasses and um, – they're they're comfortable and replaceable if they get lost or damaged working outdoors all the time. And they're they're, they're great for general use of sunglasses too. I, I buy two or three at a time in case I lose them. Or I can leave one in the car and one in the house and one in the garage. Okay, that's cool. Just yeah. So your your eyes are always safe. Yeah. And, and do they fit over? Do they fit over prescription glasses? No, no. Unfortunately, uh, these are rather rather. You know, these are tight fitting kind of wrap around. Um, dark glasses. Uh, I do have some of the bigger goggles that I use um, sometimes, but I, I, those, I, I, I used to use those all the time when I was out running weed whacker and cutting weeds or mowing and they just get so filthy and bulky and the, the straps and it never seem to work right. So I've gone for the wraparounds, but no, I don't wear any, uh, any, any regular optical glasses. So these fit neatly around, right, right around my face. Right. Okay. And tell us about another uh, tool that you, you probably carry in your um, while you're out there doing your um, work in the in the outback in the yard. Um, this is the <laughs> well, scale tool. Yeah, you know, I uh, I think I, I joked with Mark when he, at one time that that I I think I'm a maker, but I never have time to make things because I'm always just fixing things. <laughs> So I'm a fixer. No, you're a fixer, <laughs> not a maker. <laughs> Honestly, I have got a, I've got note cards of dozens of really cool creative projects that I haven't gotten to yet because I have to fix something. So I keep um, a Leatherman skeletal tool clipped on the on the belt loop of my Levi's. It is the lightest uh, um, utility tool I've ever owned. It is the bare minimum. It's needle nose pliers, wire clippers, two heads of screwdrivers, and a cutting knife all on a simple carabiner that snaps on your jeans and uh, will also open a beer bottle for you. Um, it, so it's, uh, 
It's way easier and lighter and less bulky than these kind of Swiss Army knife tools that got 55 different capabilities you never use. So um, no question, I'm, I, I've had three of these um, over the years, and this is the one, this is one, it's five ounces and um, just the right combination of tools for everything I'm doing. Like what are some of the common uses that you find yourself pulling it out for? Uh, the, I use the needle nose for um, uh, <laughs> retrieving lost hardware that falls down. You know, if you've got a washer or something <laughs> that falls down somewhere. Uh, I use the knife all the time as just a utility knife for everything, for cutting strings on the, str on the string cutter or um, – uh, just, I, I can't imagine all of the uses for a utility knife. I'm always using it for something. My, you're making a, a slight mark on a PVC pipe where I'm going to cut it. Um, uh, uh, and the uh, the screwdrivers, you know, there's both a, a flat-headed bit and a Phillips uh, bit. Unfortunately, they, they don't have all the exotic Torx bits. Uh, those, those I'd probably have to, I think there is an attachment I can get that will uh, that, I, that I can carry all those those fancy bits, but it seems to work for just about everything. Repairing anything around the house, taking a light fixture apart, or any any, any kind of mechanical work, repairing a tool, putting together a kit, a toy kit for the for the grandchildren. Well, all of the above. <laughs> okay, sounds really great. And I know that um, you you're you're a huge book fan, and you rightly think of books as tools as well. Um, and you have a nice library. So, so what's what's um, a handy tool that or book that might work as a as a way of opening up possibilities for somebody? What's 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 a book that you um, would like to suggest? One is a plug for cool tools. Okay, I, I, I had a, Thanks. I have a very good friend who was trying to reconsider his his life. Very bright friend, and I told him that. The, the all the whole earth catalogs had a transformational effect on my life and i handed him i think the, the last whole earth catalog and a new version of the next the big the big one the next whole earth catalog yeah, right, and right. cool tools and i said this this is not about the gadgets it's about the mindset so clearly that's my go-to but lately i've been uh, attempting to kind of do um an attitude adjustment of thinking about the middle east uh, I'm fascinated with ancient history, and, and I, I, I read lots of books about the Silk Road in Central Asia. But recently, I've been trying to understand more deeply um, the um, Islamic cultures, and uh, most recently, um, A Andalusia uh, in, in southern Spain, which up until 1492 was a caliphate. And it was a time of incredible harmony among Muslims, Jews, and Christians. And it was a time of, of cultural blossoming really bef before the Renaissance. And so um, there's, there's a, a book I recommend called Granada, A Pomegranate in the Hand of God, the story of Al-Andalus and the Convivencia. It's really astounding. Um, I kind of used the book as a guide and toured um, the Arabic and the, and the medieval uh, uh, Islamic Andalusia last year with, with my wife, and it was it was just a stunning eye opener to see Europe from a totally different perspective. And then, um, likewise, um, uh, Timothy McIntosh Smith is one of my all time favorite authors. I've read many of his books, but Travels with the Tangerine is one of his most astounding books. Uh, he followed the footsteps of Ibn Battuta, who was a, a erudite journalist and author working for the Sultan of the Maghreb in Morocco. And I think they, I think uh, Al-Andalus as well. Uh, and he traveled all across Northern Africa into the Middle East, up into the Black Sea, um, all the way down the Arabic Peninsula, across the Indian Ocean, into India and China, and wrote journals all the way. And so Timothy McIntosh Smith wrote a series of books following the footsteps of uh, Ibn Battuta, and um, it, it's really incredible. Uh, the, the first one is called Travels of Tangerine that takes you across North Africa, Egypt, um, and into the Black Sea. And then some of his later books um, follow Ibn Battuta into India and China. So, so, Mike, I have a question. These are like books that I've never heard of. What, what's your book discovery method? 
I read the New York Review of Books every, you know, I get that in the mail. I love to read it. all the all the universities announce their new books. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so there's stuff that never shows up in a bookstore for for you know for nonfiction and academic yeah. writing. And then I've got an amazing Twitter feed. Uh, <clears throat> I have I follow every major uh, publisher's journal and um, major the, all the major book reviews, New York, New Yorker, New York Review. Um, the, the London Review of Books, all, they all tweet. And so I just have a literary Twitter stream that I can scan any time to kind of follow what new titles do I want that's to read. Cool. So, now, we, you know, just, so that's like a tweet deck. That's a tweet deck column is publishers. Channel. Yeah, it's just mm-hmm. a channel. It's a literary channel. And, and so I, I, and I tune it for the, for the reviewers that seem to have matched my taste. That's really cool, Mike. One of the one of the last ones uh, I'd, I'd really like re- like to recommend because it's vanishing fast, and I know Kevin's interested in vanishing Asia. There are a, a, about a dozen vanishing religions in the Middle East um, that um, are just fascinating. And Jer- a guy named Jared Russell has written a book about the heirs to the forgotten kingdoms, about all the all of the tribes that are on their last stands uh, across the Middle East. It's beautiful, we, you know. Um, we saw uh, the, uh, the crisis with the Yazidis during the ISIS and Syrian wars. And, you know, this book was written just before then. There's a lovely chapter in there about the Yazidis and all the other obscure cultures of the Middle East. I'm sorry, we just include, include uh, religions like the Druids and, and others uh, that are kind of minority religions, the Ishmaelites yes. and stuff like that? All, all, yes, yes. It's a review of, 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 of all of these uh, obscure sex. And by the way, um, uh, Macintosh Smith talks about Ibn Battuta talking about seeing icons of the prophet Muhammad in Christian churches in the black sea. And that, um, he, he, he also mentioned that, uh, icons of Jesus and Mary are in the Kabbalah or the Kaaba, which is what's the black cube in Mecca, right? In Mecca. Yeah. Yeah. It, inside the Holy shrine, there, there are icons of Jesus and Mary in there. So, right. uh, there, all, the, the summation of all of these books is really uh, what an ecumenical world exists in various times in history, you know, where people right, actually right. got along well. Well, these are fantastic, Mike. We really, they're really great. There, there's, you're going from kind of your sit behind a desk and read books to um, clearing the lower 40, um, fantastic range of tools. What, what, what's, we want to talk about what you're kind of um, interested in these days. What's the project that you're working on that you want to tell people about? Three things that people might be interested in, and you know, one certainly uh, overlaps with your own work, Kevin, on the future of, of digital technologies. But I've got some private interests. Uh, I've been very active with the Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space. Uh, it's a group that that uh, manages sixty four thousand acres of open space di- uh, of wild forests on the San Francisco Peninsula, and uh, uh, over five years. Uh, I've been trying to get them to appoint um, a chief scientist and have an independent scientific mission to uh, create baseline inventory and, and survey of the habitats and species at, to, to build to build policy on. And after five years of many negotiation, just this week, they just approved a whole scientific program um, that um, <clears throat> to build a baseline um, understanding of the habitats and species in all the open space property. So it, it was a, it's a week of it's a quiet personal victory i'm celebrating <laughs> i don't i didn't do this with any group i just worked privately with them for five years trying to encourage them to appoint a scientific uh, advisory board and to set policy and they finally did it so that's a, that's one thing right and if you are in the bay area this is a wonderful group the the open um public lands to to, to support um in terms of trying to Preserve him, and also, you know, like the Bay Ridge Trail, trying to make trails uh, to to um, access some of these places. So, so it's a great thing to support if you have if you have any interest in it in the Bay Area. Yeah, and the most fascinating thing is something that I was I I got into it with them originally, ta- uh, uh, trying to explore what really is going on with pesticides, and I started understanding sort of the the molecular chemistry of the root systems that things like Roundup work on. And I, I found that um, groups who were doing sampling whole um, microbiome habitats, so they do something called environmental DNA, and they sample the, the health of all the microorganisms in the 
in a, a soil sample. And uh, so that came from I'm trying to understand pesticides. And since then, so I, I recommended that they, they use techniques like environmental DNA, and they're already doing it at a research laboratory over here near Stanford called Jasper Ridge, is the, if you sample a, a cubic volume of soil, you can get inventory of all the species, not just the, the, the microorganisms, but raccoons, mice, bobcats, mountain lions, birds. Uh, there's, there's genetic materials for all of them. So it's an exciting new way to monitor and inventory the, uh, the habitat, uh, the health of a habitat. And it's, it, it, it implies there's a possible future for citizen science where people can actually go out and help an institution like a, a massive forest preserve take samples and better understand the um, ecologies of all the, all the different uh, microbiomes. Well, thanks, Mike. We really appreciate um, your joining us this morning. Um, it's been a long I've wanted to have you on for a long time. And we finally got around to doing it. So good luck in keeping that um, part up on the ridge, uh, you know, uh, safe for fire because it is a huge concern. Um, and it's a lot of work, I understand. Yeah, I'm still here. Mike, I just wanted to uh, also say thank you so much. It's great. Uh, you're always full of surprises um, every time I talk to you at, at Institute for the Future and uh, on this call as well. And uh, your, your book recommenda recommendations were particularly interesting to me. I'm going to check some of those out. So, so thanks so much, Mike. Hey, everybody. It's Mark from the Cool Tools Podcast. I want to thank you for being a listener to Cool Tools. And I also would like to let you know about our Patreon page. If you would like to support the Cool Tools show, as well as our video channel, the website, and all the newsletters that we do, you can go to patreon.com slash cool tools, that's just one word, cool tools, and pledge any amount you want. You could even pledge a dollar a month. Every little bit helps. We have editors, we pay for transcribing costs, we pay our reviewers. Every bit of money that you contribute goes towards supporting the show. I'd like to give a shout out to our supporters of the Cool Tools podcast. This week, I'd like to thank the following Patreon supporters. Bill Schuler, Bob Kay, Ryan Pelly, Carl D. Patterson, Chad Cosby, Chris Wheeland, Chris Weirstook, Craig Tooker, Dan O'Brien, Dean Putney, Donnell Cunningham, Evan Barker, Graham Medlin, Hans Riesbeck, Helen Hegedus, Jerry Kearns, Jim Lesko, Jim Spofford, John Pollock, John Burdenbaugh, Keith O, Ken Altman, Les Howard, Lauren Bast, Mock Nerd, Malton Make, Mark Goebel, Matt Gromes, Michael Douglas, Michael Jones, and Michael Pecorini. Thanks to all of you for supporting the Cool Tools Show. We really appreciate it. <laughs>